Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're trying something. Pray, pray. <coughs> Hello? Is it working? The, but is the, uh, mic, is the uh, speaker working? Oh, okay. <coughs> Gonna be shouting again. Hi. <coughs> I, um, before we, um, you know, we start with the prayer, but before we start with the prayer, I want to I want to talk to you just a moment about Chip. Who remembers Chip last week? Came in here with about 27 kids, and they had a converted a school bus that they were traveling the world with. Okay. He had a marvelous time, and he wanted me to tell you that. His children had a marvelous time, and as much as I talk about and try to encourage you to engage in the act of personal outreach, personal evangelism, take this, take this message with you everywhere you go. It's not just what's happening here for two hours on Sunday morning, but it's what's happening in our households, across kitchen tables, in the rest of the week. As much as I talk about that, what we do here on Sunday can be powerful, and that's what this is about. Chip came in, brought all the kids, and after church, I guess they come, I, I guess they worship normally, worship normally, anyway, I guess they worship uh, regularly at a church that, that does not uh, sing a cappella. They have, they have instruments. And he said, man, my kids, they would just, they just went on and on and on about the music. They just loved it. So, so see what we do when we worship, you know, we, we kind of sell ourselves short sometimes thinking, oh, we're just kind of boring and dull. And if we need, if we could just upgrade, we could reach more people. Let me tell you something. There are some people that are tired of all of the blare that they're dealing with in other worship experiences. Now, I'm not talking to you about purely salesmanship here, but we have something that the world is looking for when we lift our voices up to God. And he took, he, he was so, he was feeling so good about worship and with his, his, his experience with his children. And he was at a park with the kids later that day, ran into some, some uh, lady who said she was looking for a church. She said, man, have I got a church for you. <laughs> and was telling her all about us. And he said, and the music, you wouldn't believe the music. C can you believe somebody's talking about that? I mean, sometimes, I, I, sometimes when visitors come in and said, hey, can I buy a piano for you? <laughs> People have offered to do that for me, for us. Not, uh, in my in my life in ministry, <clears throat> and I said, no, 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 we, we we like it this way. We're doing it this way. You know, we feel like God wants us to do it this way. And um, but he was talking about the music, and she said, well, that's great because I'm going to join the choir. And he said, he said the congregation is the choir. Isn't that nice? Okay, so good on you. You may not think you can sing, but keep on singing. If you, if you get lost, find somebody that you think is in, their regis in your register, go sit next to them for a while and learn. What we do here blesses people and more importantly blesses God because it is consistent with the first thousand years of church history. It is consistent with the teaching of the New Testament. And there's nothing... God blesses obedience. He'll bless obedience. All right. I just wanted to share that with you because I told you I'm going to give, give you a little bit of snippet every week about outreach, and that's your, that's your snippet today. Be proud of who you are. Don't um, Take ownership of what God has done with you and be obedient because God blesses obedience. Father in heaven, open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, open our hearts that we may obey, <clears throat> be fruitful and multiply. Fill us with your spirit, fill us with your joy. Teach us, Lord, to be cheerful givers of our time, of our treasure, of our hearts. And Lord, increase our influence in this city as we increase our obedience to you. Make us, mold us into a church full of disciples who make disciples. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is alive and well and working in the world today, amen? amen. So, <clears throat> when I was in college, 
40 years ago. That's a difficult admission to make. I heard a guest speaker at Harding where I went, where I did my undergrad work. His name is Dr. Bill Banowski. He had quite a career. He was president of Pepperdine, Pepperdine in the 60s and 70s, president of the University of Oklahoma for many years, very active in politics in the 70s and 80s. He was a real mover and shaker and a powerful witness to Christ as well. He told a story about his time as an undergrad at David Lipscomb College that I never forgot. Has anybody ever dealt with the school cafeterias? Ain't it fun? This is a cafeteria story. Seems there was a cafeteria lady there at David Lipscomb who was grouchy. Has anyone ever dealt with that? She was surly, grouchy, unpleasant. Nobody liked her. People were kind of afraid of her whenever, you know, because she was giving you your food. You never knew what she was going to do with you. <laughs> she was kind of mean, okay? And the future doc Dr. Banowski decided he was going to flip the script because he had gotten tired of dealing with her dark demeanor. So when they saw each other one fateful morning in the breakfast line, she was angrily slinging out eggs to people. People were dodging. <laughs> and Brother Banowski said loudly enough for everyone to hear when their eyes met, I'd like some eggs, please, and some kind words along with it. The gauntlet was thrown down. A sudden silence fell upon everybody who heard. And as Dr. Banowski, Banowski described this confrontation when I was back in my 20s, I couldn't help but think of a couple of rams getting, you know, have you seen the rams? You know how they kind of they kind of stare at each other? There was a stare down going on, and you're thinking, oh, my goodness, it's going to happen. She glared at him, and he looked back at her, determined not to look away, awaiting to hear kind words, which he received. A wry smile creased her face. And in a low voice, almost a whisper, she looked at him and said, you want kind words? Don't eat the eggs. <laughs> One of my favorite stories. Her attitude needed to change. And this college student confronted her about her attitude. too negative. And that college student, long before he became a big man, kind of forced his new friend into embracing a little bit a more positive attitude, a more positive outlook, maybe not completely joyful, but he helped move her a little bit closer to the joy than she was previously. She needed that joy, and she needed to pursue that joy. Can't we all agree this morning that we could use more joy as we travel through this veil of tears? Amen. Life is hard. Life is difficult. And speaking for myself, I believe that joy is actually a powerful persuader. I also believe that surliness, neg negativity, and sourness is also a powerful persuader and not in a good way. Oh, here he comes again. You know, where am I going to go? I've got I've to hide. You know, he's just don't want to talk with that one. Always criticizing, always nitpicking, always negative, joyless, faithless, lifeless, and really more than lifeless, kind of life-sucking. Life you know, you can just see the life getting sucked out of people as they, as they interact. Don't you just love hanging out with folks like that? Makes me really, really happy. <sighs> Joy is the antidote for that. Joy will overcome that. Joy will give you victory as you navigate your way through life's disappointments. There I said it, life can be disappointed. Who's been disappointed? All right, three of you raised your hands. The rest of you are lying. We've all, <laughs> we've all been disappointed, right? We've all been disappointed, right? We've all been disappointed, right? 
Smile about it. Find that joy. Look for that joy. Pursue that joy. And the good news this morning, our Heavenly Father wants to give us joy. The Word says that. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. As we walk in the Spirit, as we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh, as we walk in the Spirit, our Father gives us the fruit of joy. And we need it. One of my favorite stories in the book of in, in the Old Testament has already been an excerpt of it has already been read to you. Nehemiah chapter eight. Ezra the scribe reads the law to the people. It took a long time until midday, I believe, as the word says. He was placed on a platform, and others were given task to give the understanding. So he's reading the word, and then others are explaining the word so that the people understand what the word what the word is saying. And the people worshipped, as you might imagine. They should have worshipped. Amen, they said. And the people wept. For the people wept when they heard the words of the law, it says in Nehemiah. We just read a moment ago. I believe when they heard those words, they knew how far they had fallen short of God's commands, hence the weeping. Have you ever come face to face with your own iniquity and felt kind of bad about it? Have you ever come face to face with your own sin and felt, how, could you, how can you even love me, Father? He does. And part of his love is demonstrated when he allows us to come face to face with our own sin because how are we going to get any better if we don't face it? Nehemiah had a solution, though. Listen to these, his words again. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat. My favorite words in the Bible. <laughs> Eat the fat. Drink the sweet. And send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our God. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. See, it's good that they were exposed to the law. It's good that they were exposed to how far they had fallen short. They needed to hear it, even if it served as a reminder that they weren't as good as they thought they were. Even if it caused them to weep. Beloved, when you discover that you have sinned, that's a good day. May not feel good in the moment, but it's a good day. But to wallow in despair for too long is not a good thing. The Apostle Paul says something about that in the book of 2 Corinthians, where the man who had, who had been sinning grievously, grievously against God and it was instructed in 1 Corinthians to be, to be disfellowshipped, to be taken out, kicked out of the church, he, they, encourage, he, they were encouraged to welcome him back lest he be overcome by overmuch sorrow. So to be overwhelmed with sorrow is not a good thing. There is such a thing as having too much sorrow. So what was the prescription? Feasting, sharing, rejoicing, putting aside the sorrow. They were commanded to have a feast and commanded to share with people that didn't have enough goods to have their own feast. It was to be a day of celebration because they had found the law again, because they had heard the law, and because the law had showed them where they had fallen short. And they needed to put aside that sorrow. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? Amen. It is our strength. You know, since the earliest days of the church, when Christians were rounded up, persecuted, and killed, the joy with which they faced their death in the flesh, looking forward to being in paradise with Jesus, was a testimony that the Romans could never overcome. They thought 
that by crucifying people and throwing them to the lions and do the, doing all, all this public shaming of the Christians that they were going to tear them down. But all that did was advertise. And people were going, how could someone face their own death with that much joy? Because, you know, the world in those days wasn't very joyful. Kind of like the world today. What can you do about a people who being sent to their death meet their maker singing hymns? What can you do to a people as they're about to meet their maker as the lions are charging them? They're not backing away from the lions, but they're charging the lions with songs, on their, with songs emanating from their mouths. That kind of joyful exuberance preaches. Many, seeing the joy with which the martyrs died, were drawn to follow Jesus. I want some of that. I want what they have. And you know what else this pre and you know what else preaches? We who embrace the daily grind in the marketplace, in, a, in the workplace, with our families, in our churches, wherever we volunteer, wherever we go, when we embrace that grind joyfully, responding to the day's difficulties with smiles on our faces and songs in our mouths, that is a powerful witness to our neighbors who haven't met Christ yet. They're paying attention to that. Your joy will attract their attention. <sighs> yeah, but I'm kind of in a bad mood. It hadn't gone on that long since about 86. <laughs> and, and, I can't, and I can't seem to shake it. And I don't think it's going to change. Um, if you've been listening today, do, do you believe God's word? Uh, that's really the only thing I can ask you. Do you believe what the word of God says? Because this really is a test of our faith. It's counterintuitive. I, I freely admit that to believe God's word is to go against every message that's, that, that, that's all around us, which would say that you're all alone and that you're stuck in this world and, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just all up to you, right? If you've been listening today, though, I've already told you two things you can do that will increase your joy. One, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, the last three weeks, last two weeks, we've talked about what it really means to walk in the Spirit. And just to <clears throat> remind you, it involves changing your focus. Those who live by the Spirit have their mind set on the things of the Spirit, and those who live by the flesh have their mind set on the things of the flesh. So we've got to change our focus from the things of the flesh all the bills and all the other stuff and all the people and all the other stuff and all the other stuff and all the other stuff. And we've got to redirect our mindset toward the things of the Spirit. Changing our mindset. And then today, what do we learn from Nehemiah? Little feasting doesn't hurt. Little sharing doesn't hurt. In fact, that's what was commanded. That was the command given to the people who were about to be overcome by overmuch sorrow was to feast and to share and to rejoice on purpose. I've told the story of my aunt who had a very sad life for many, many years, but the last 20 years of her life were joyful. And one of the reasons they were joyful is because she, every day, at her sewing machine where she did upholstery, had put a bumper sticker that read, Praise the Lord Anyhow. She made a decision that she was going to pursue joy. And I miss that woman. And when I go back to Arkansas and I drive past the house where she lived, it was actually just tacked onto the back of a former gas station. The work was all done in the front with the upholstery shop, and she and her husband lived in a tiny little room out back. That place is holy ground. 
because that's where my aunt found her joy. See, however you interpret what was told to the people in Nehemiah, it absolutely is pointing to some intentional rejoicing behavior. They made a decision to rejoice. And that's certainly consistent with Paul's admonition to the church at Philippi in chapter 4 where he says, Rejoice in the Lord, what? Always, again I say, you know that. We sing it, right? Rejoice in the Lord, always, again I say, rejoice. So even though this joy is described as the fruit of the Spirit, it's not really automatic. It's a result of our changing our focus. It's a result of a decision that we make. And our walking in the Spirit will build up our joy. And our, and, and our participation in rejoicing activities, whatever that may be, will increase our joy. You can add to your joy by intentionally rejoicing, praising, feasting, sharing, worshiping. And you can add to your joy by walking in the Spirit, thereby receiving the fruit of the Spirit, joy. Beloved, joy can be yours if you will accept it. So accept it. I don't think I've said anything to you today that is uh, new. But I do believe I've said something to you today that for many of us we don't want to do. We'd rather wallow in the stuff. We'd rather repeat the list of grievances over and over and over. You know what? As you're repeating your list of grievances, would you add to it two blessings for every grievance? Maybe that's a good place to start. So much for you. If you just take your he's promised so many things to you. If you take a little time and read the Bible, you'll know it. It's time to accept the joy that is our birthright. Let's talk to our Father in heaven. Lord, <clears throat> Forgive us, forgive me for getting cranky and griping and moaning. And Lord, help us, help me to every day begin with gratitude and thanksgiving and joy. As I understand your word, it's our birthright. And I pray that we will receive that birthright as we walk in the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Are you a Christian? Because today's message was for people that have already made the deci decision to come to Christ. Are you one? Have you heard about Jesus? Have you accepted that he is the Messiah? Have you repented of your sins? Have you confessed your sins and confessed Christ? Have you been immersed in the name of Christ? for the forgiveness of your sins and the receipt of the gift of the Holy Spirit. If those have been your experience, you can know without doubt that you're in the kingdom of God. How can I be so sure about that? The Bible tells me so. Scripture tells us that. If that has not been your experience, I pray that you would come forward, confess Christ, repent of your sins, be baptized into Christ and be added to the church. Because see, if all of this is yours, then his spirit is in you. This spirit that gives us joy is in you. Without his spirit, you're going to be white knuckling it. And that'll work for a while. Maybe. But with his spirit, his eternal spirit, It'll work for good. Plus, you have all of us friends and neighbors around you to help you. Come to Jesus while we stand and sing.